Hello everyone and welcome to the Orthodox Wanderer YouTube channel. Today is a very special episode for me and I and I hope for you as well. Uh, today I sat down and spoke with Father the Archpriest Dionysi Poznaev. Uh, Father Dionysi or Dennis as we say in English is the priest of the Saints Peter and Paul Church in Hong Kong, China. Father Dennis has been involved in missionary efforts in China for more than 25 years and in our conversation shares his experiences, his, uh, what they have been doing, what they are doing, what they hope to do in the future. And I really emphasize that this is a special episode for me because Father Dennis is one of my biggest role models and someone I, I truly look up to and, and, and pray I can be you know at least 5% of as good of a clergyman as he is. So without further ado, here is my talk with Father Dennis. Enjoy it as much as I do. And at the end of the video, Father Dennis explains how we could help uh, him and his parish to further their missionary works. Here is my talk with Father Dennis. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to my talk today with Father Dionysi from, from Hong Kong. Hello, Father Dennis. How are you today? Uh, hello. Thank you for the invitation. I'm fine. Glad to be here. I, I'm very, very excited to, to be able to speak to you. And I think, you know, a lot of people have, have been eager to hear uh, how orthodoxy is doing in Asia and in particular, maybe Hong Kong and China. So I'm, I'm just super, super excited myself. So let's get right into it, Father. Let's 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 just start about yourself and how how did you end up in China? If you could maybe briefly or or if you want to do it longer, it's up to you. But how did you end up in China? If you could tell us. I had some kind of interest to Chinese culture and to China uh, in my since my childhood. I like Chinese characters when I was very young, and uh, we have uh, several family friends who are um, prominent sinologists, maybe because of their influence. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I had an idea to be a priest since uh, my 13th. Uh, finally, I found a way how to uh, combine these two ministers to be a priest and uh, to do something in China, for China, uh, and to be involved in Chinese affairs. Uh, it was a, a missionary work, and uh, I started to visit Beijing. Uh, started to learn Chinese uh, in nineties. Uh, met many people which uh, who were related to the uh, story of Chinese Orthodox in twentieth century. Read several books. Uh, started to visit Beijing in nineteen ninety four, and finally moved to Hong Kong in two thousand two. Uh, there will be already twenty years. Oh yeah, twenty years ago. Uh, so and settled down here. Uh, to to be missionary peace for Hong Kong and for mainland China. Okay, so already already during your seminary studies back home in Russia, you you were uh, somehow you decided or your wish was to go to to China. Yes. Yes, it was my uh, idea. Finally, my project, which I introduced to uh, current patriarch, who was the Department of. Uh, uh, head of the Department of External Church Relations, and he accepted my project and uh, blessed me to work in this field, and we started this. Okay, okay, so it's wonderful. So just to make it clear, you do you do speak some Chinese, right? Yes, uh, yes, I do. Okay, so that I think that's 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 important for missionary work. So could not you give Cantonese, us not, not, not Cantonese, but uh, Mandarin? Mandarin, yes, because there's different dialects, Cantonese, Mandarin, and I think there's even probably more in some other areas as well, different types. So, Father, could you give us maybe some brief history about, you know, orthodoxy in China and Hong Kong, just like a brief overview uh, about missionary efforts in, in this great, great, huge country? Uh, I would say that in the recent time, it's quite a new time, uh, history begins in uh, the end of 17th century and related to the uh, Chinese uh, and Russian affairs. Uh, so China captured uh, one uh, fortress near the border, al Bazino, and uh, moved uh, some Russian soldiers uh, to Beijing, settled them to be in Beijing, and they uh, start to live there for generations, uh, keeping Orthodox faith. And because of their presence in Hong Kong, it was a reason in, in Beijing. It was a reason to establish a Russian ecclesiastical mission in the beginning of 18th century, uh, with the decision of Emperor 
Emperor Peter the Great and the Chinese Emperor Can see. And they started uh, missionary work, but uh, also were involved in international relations. Uh, so the purpose of existing and uh, of this mission was double-sided, political, diplomatic, and also missionary. Uh, finally, in the end of 19th century, they started to do pure missionary work, and it was uh, more or less successful, but a relatively short period of time. Uh, until time of uh, Russian Revolution, Communist Revolution, so less than, less than half century. But they already uh, ordained several priests, translated a lot of uh, liturgical texts into Chinese, and uh, established the basis, the basis, at least the base uh, of Orthodox mission. <clears throat> and uh, after that, uh, there was a period of waves of Russian immigrants who moved from uh, Soviet Union to China, escaping from communists, and they somehow stopped this missionary work. And uh, church life in China uh, became more national-oriented to serve uh, Russian expatriates who settled down in China. However, in Shanghai and also in Beijing, missionary work uh, continued uh, in a natural way because there were Chinese Orthodox priests and also Chinese believers uh, who were minority in this church, uh, <clears throat> but until and until 50s, when uh, People's Republic of China were established and uh, Russian people started to move out of China to other countries, to the United States, to Australia, and some of them back to Soviet Union. And uh, time for missionary work was not very convenient already. They had 10 years probably uh, to change everything in church life, to become it more local, uh, to ordain more priests. But uh, in environment of uh, Chinese communism and with a bad political, uh, with, uh, later on with bad political affairs between Soviet Union during Khrushchev time, and Mao Zedong in China, finally, Chinese church uh, was institutionally destroyed. Uh, in Hong Kong, the parish was established in 1934, and it was a semi-grand parish completely uh, until the death of he, its first director, Father Dmitry Spensky, who passed away in 1970, buried here, and his wife and his daughter also. Uh, and we pretend to uh, be uns uns uh, ask, uh, call him ancestor for our parish, pretend to continue this line of presence in Hong Kong and re-establish uh, church activity with the same church name, Apostle uh, Saints Peter and Paul, re-establish into 003 after my uh, settlement to Hong Kong. Uh, and now the parish is much more orient missionary oriented, and, and uh, I think it's our main goal here. Okay, so so it seems that before establishment of communism in China, uh, the Chinese uh, government and the emperor they were quite open to to have Orthodox people in their land. Is this true? Uh, yes, uh, they have some limits, uh, and uh, of course uh, some condition to presence. Uh, especially until the end of 19th century. But generally speaking, policy of uh, limitation and control for religious activities, something typical for China uh, in period of empire and now in the period of uh, Chinese communism. And short time of exception uh, was in the first half of the 20th century. Yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting. So you told me that your, the main focus of your parish now of Saints Peter and Paul in, in Hong Kong is, is missionary efforts, uh, that you know, your, your parish is engaging in such missionary efforts. If you could maybe perhaps give some examples of how such missionary work can look, if we perhaps start with Hong Kong first, how, how does such missionary work actually function in Hong Kong? Uh, so we, first of all, need uh, materials in Chinese. That means we work on translation. Uh, liturgical texts and uh, catechetical and theological books addressed to various groups of people uh, 
ordinary people, people who are just beginners in their interest or a group which are quite academically advanced. We have to satisfy interests of, of different groups, uh, especially in theological literature. And another complicated task is a translation of liturgical texts, uh, which require a lot of efforts, uh, a lot of sources. We place them in the internet. It's now a very convenient tool for missionary work because uh, people communicating using internet, especially in big cities like Hong Kong, people often don't turn to socialize. Uh, they experience quite hard pressure from the megapolis uh, and uh, often prefer to stay alone in their homes and uh, quite welcome online activity, I would say. Uh, but of course, we have also offline activity. It's our church service, which we celebrate daily. And we try to uh, celebrate parts in Chinese and also in English and less and less in Slavonic, which is traditional for us. So, so would you say that... Sometimes we publish publishing books, so we do missionary activity on our website. Uh, we also hold some academic lectures from time to time, inviting uh, visiting uh, scholars to, 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 to deliver uh, courses of uh, lectures and leading theological institutions of Hong Kong. Yes, that, that's very nice. So would you say that how big percentage of your parish today in Hong Kong is, is made up of converts? Is it 50%? Is it less? Is it more? I think uh, 30 to 40 percent uh, are local Chinese. Okay, well, that, that's, that's, that's wonderful. And, and, and how is the Hong Kong uh, political environment for your activities? Because I, I know it has been quite okay since you came, but there's maybe been some change now, or is it still, is it still okay for you to be in Hong Kong? Uh, it's uh, very convenient, I would say. We still enjoy uh, uh, religious freedom here. Uh, probably it may change because Beijing will influence and change uh, Hong Kong uh, system of law step by step to control more its uh, tendency uh, which is which you can see quite clear uh, but still we operating quite free without any uh, uh, limitations okay that, that's good to hear and if we and if we switch our focus to mainland china because as you said in the beginning uh, your activities is not only limited to hong kong but it, it also expands so to speak to mainland china uh, in what way are you able to do missionary work in mainland China while being in Hong Kong? If you could maybe speak about some, some of those aspects of, of missionary work in China. Uh, for these 20 years, we established unofficial communities in mainland China, <clears throat> in uh, neighboring cities, uh, Shenzhen and Guangzhou as well, and in North China in uh, Dalian city. Uh, we also uh, worked on establishing of uh, Parish under consulates, consulate in Shanghai and Russian embassy in Beijing. And we also work on uh, recruiting of uh, students to seminary that started in Russia. And uh, two of them actually were ordained as a Chinese priest and uh, officially recognized by the government. And they celebrate in official parishes. But uh, somehow created not a network, but a group of communities, unofficial and official, <clears throat> to celebrate regular services. And uh, another task, of course, is uh, distribution of uh, books, uh, issue printing in Hong Kong and distributing in mainland China, now more in electronic format, uh, uh, because even sending mail from Hong Kong to China is now limited. We cannot say send religious books uh, using uh, ordinary post, uh, ordinary mail, mail service. Uh, so we switched more to electronic books, which is still are accessible in mainland China. Okay, so you said that, for instance, these two new, newly ordained priests who were accepted by the government, you speak, of course, of the Chinese government, yes, that they were accepted by them. Yes. So they are able to serve officially, but are they able to freely mis do missionary work or they have to be lay very low? Uh, this is the framework of their parishes. Uh, they are quite limited and, of course, controlled by uh, controlling institutions. 
Yes, yes. Well, at least they're there. So I, I know myself, I visited uh, one of the churches in Beijing at the embassy, uh, the Russian church at the Russian embassy. And when I spoke to the priest, he said that he obviously cannot do anything outside the boundaries of his own small community because it's very much controlled. So I would think it's the same with these yeah. Chinese priests. Uh, no, they have uh, their own place, uh, the church in, their, in the Mongolia and Harbin and uh, in the framework of their parishes, they can do a lot. Oh, okay. Well, I, I'm actually happily surprised to, to hear about that. So, so that, that, that's actually good, wonderful. Uh, but generally, you, you, you would say that in mainland China, it's probably much more difficult than in Hong Kong, correct? To, to, to convey and uh, to do any missionary activities. Yeah, indeed. It always was uh, this way, and now it's still like this. Yes, it's the same. It's the same. So I wanted to ask you just you know some practical questions about about China and Orthodoxy. What would you say is like the the general view of Chinese people? Let's start with Hong Kong. What is their view on Orthodoxy? Are they familiar at all with Orthodox faith, or are they ignorant? Are they curious? Like, what is the somehow their yeah their 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 approach to, to Orthodoxy? Uh, so, uh, they're quite curious towards orthodoxy because it's something new, it's uh, marginal for them, the new Catholic Church, uh, because uh, Catholics are 7% of the population of Hong Kong and Catholic Church here is active. They know Anglican Church, also some uh, other Protestant churches, uh, but orthodoxy, I think that... Uh, for those people who start uh, to study orthodoxy, probably uh, their view focusing on there is a um, lo localized national variant uh, version of uh, Christianity. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, I understand. So they're curious, yes. Uh, that's, that's interesting. So I wanted to ask you, uh, oh, and of course, in mainland China, we, we, this was about Hong Kong. Is it the same in mainland China or are people different there towards the, the Orthodox faith? Gen generally speaking, it's the same, except of uh, places where Orthodox churches were present at, uh, for a long time, like Harbin or Xinjiang. But in Harbin and in Xinjiang, even, even Chinese authorities associate uh, Orthodox church with uh, Russian ethnic minority which is one of minorities in mainland China. So, so, so they see it more as uh, serving the minority and not so much, so, you know, trying to convert them? Yes. Okay, okay, that, that's, that's interesting. So, uh, wh what, what do you think is the, ortho, you know, what potential does orthodoxy have uh, to attract Asian people? What I mean by that is, what, what specific in orthodoxy do you think can actually appeal to, to, to Chinese people? Is there some aspect you think that, that could be more appealing to Chinese people than other Christian uh, denominations? Um, I think that uh, orthodox worship is quite attractive. Uh, church culture, icon painting, uh, Sure, singing, generally speaking, that's a very attractive and important part for Chinese, uh, because Chinese traditionally likes rituals. Of course, now Chinese people are quite, quite uh, globalized, westernized, but still they have some roots and some uh, traditional approach uh, to the social order. And rituals is something important uh, for Chinese who are generally quite cultural people. Uh, so Orthodox worship is indeed attractive, uh, very attractive to them. They uh, like long services, they like uh, church singing, church arts. It's uh, maybe more emotional approach than intellectual, I would say, yeah. in this way. Would you say it's comparable to to uh, to the Japanese people? If we look at writings of Saint Nicholas of Japan, he spoke some sometimes about this. But in the context of Japan, would you say there's a lot of similar things between the Chinese and Japanese in terms of this approach to orthodoxy? Yes, I I, I would say I, I I see a lot of similarity. Yes, yes, that, that that's the feeling I got from visiting both Japan and and China. Uh, that, that's definitely the, the, the feeling one gets. 
Um, and, and, and do you uh, yourself in your services or in your architecture or anything else, do you incorporate any Chinese cultural aspects, which are obviously appropriate uh, and are not uh, heterodox? Do you incorporate them? Uh, yes, it's one of uh, methods of enculturation, traditional for European approach to missionary work in China to be more localized. Uh, but we need to have a uh, good balance because actually uh, people here are looking from Christianity more universal sense than local. But uh, Europeans quite often pretend to be localized through usage of uh, uh, local cultural strategies. But uh, nowadays, uh, I think it's a little bit outdated. Mm-hmm. So it's not point of our main interest. We use it because it's nice, uh, it's unusual, which also sounds active, uh, but uh, I think it's a supplementary st- strategy. Yes, I think I read about, you know, the Jesuits, the Roman Catholic Jesuits who came uh, to China, I think 17th, 18th century. They did a lot of this, if I recall correctly, and it didn't always work. And sometimes it even led to to some heresies because they would adopt too much of the local, uh, both uh, culture, but also religion. Uh, The people in China don't want to see uh, a psychological effect. They uh, They want to see something new. Uh, unusual, exceptional, but if we offer to them something related to their ordinary life, uh, they may be frustrated. Yes. So we shall not show to them ordinary life. Yes, that's, that's a very, we very... find good, good forms to show super ordinary life. Yeah. That's a, that's a very, very good point, you know, because I think often when we think about uh, missionary work, we, we, we almost romanticize and, and think in these terms of let's, let's adopt as much as we can to the local culture. But sometimes, like you say, uh, maybe actually the opposite is necessary, you know, for people to find that the difference is something actually better, you know. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. In fact, they're looking for Christianity, but local culture is not Christian culture. So they somehow... Try to try to stay away, but our big goal is, of course, to create a local uh, Orthodox culture, which can combine many elements of uh, universal senses and uh, local expression. But it takes time and generations. Yeah, it's it not a simple goal. Yeah. Surely, I think I think time is one one of the things that uh, my generation and those younger it's very hard to understand that things can actually take time. You know, we we are brought up in an age where well when things should happen quickly, uh, but I think when you speak about time and generations, it can be tens, if not hundreds, of years even. You know, of such effort. Uh, it's, uh, it should be natural growth, not 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 artificial. It should be natural growth. Yeah. Of course, uh, we cultivate it, we work on it, what it takes time. Yes. So, so would you say that the orthodoxy in China and Hong Kong, is it, is it growing or, or is it, is, does it stay on the same level as it has been? Uh, slightly growing, uh, very slightly, but uh, it depends on efforts and our efforts depends on our sources. We are limited in our sources, so they cannot expect uh big results in short time yes yes i will surely before we uh, before we end you can tell some more like in a, in a little while about how we could help and i will put a link how, how people could help your parish uh, to do better missionary work we could do that at the end um and you mentioned that a few uh, Ru- uh, not russians a few chinese seminarians they study in russia are there many of them uh, that do this or is it only a few uh i think Around 10, around 10 people uh, admitted to seminary and finally we have two graduated and ordained because of various reasons, mostly because of their personal reasons. Okay, okay. So, so, so when they go to seminary to Russia, they, they get like an approval from the Chinese state, right? Uh, not all of them. Uh, the, the picture is more complicated. Uh, for example, one of them uh, came to Russia first without approval of Chinese government and returned, got approval and 
uh, come second time to graduate finally. Okay. Uh, no, not all of them were approved, so the situation is quite, quite variative. Yes, but but they have all the resources to do to conduct. You you have all the resources to conduct the liturgies and services in the local language, correct? Now, uh, still we don't have uh, all texts translated into Chinese. We work on it. Okay, but but I suppose you have the liturgy already, right? I think this was the first. Yes, of course we have liturgy. We have our logion. We have we have uh, some directory hosts. Uh, have partly uh, translated services of 12 great feasts but not 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 all not all not all yeah it, it, it takes time and, and money and money and you and you, and you mentioned um, uh, you know uh, that in hong kong you celebrate uh, both in chinese and english and some slavonic and and obviously for those uh, that know hong kong know that it's a very uh, or at least it was before the pandemic a very multicultural uh, city with many people coming from all over the world have you had any converts who are uh, not Russian, not Chinese, but simply for perhaps just visitors to Hong Kong who work there? Have, have you had such converts? Yes, yes, we have. Uh, in the last year, I have a uh, French family uh, which moved from, from Paris and uh, worked here in Hong Kong for one year. Uh, unfortunately, they moved to the United States, but uh, they were it's a very good family. But because of crisis of their work, the company relocated them to the United States. Yes, well, because yes, I think we also that have uh, Armenian people here and Serbian people here who ask to baptize their kids uh, from time to time. Also, so, kids from mixed family, mixed couples. Yeah. So, so the other Orthodox faithful in Hong Kong would usually come to your church, like Serbs and Romanians and, and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, yes, but uh, we have also Church of ecumenical patriarchate here and i think that uh, most american people visiting that church okay i see uh, but we have some europeans especially if, uh, francophones or uh, russian french families uh, or families of uh, russian by immigrants to france mm -hmm. so they are quite uh, quite francophone oriented because I, I think even French is more spread in the Paris than English. English is a common language, of course, yeah. uh, but they have uh, more French native speakers oh, among Paris members. That, that's very interesting. That's, uh, that's actually very uh, unexpected for a place like Hong Kong. So, At least for us, who are not there. <laughs> I have a lot of French people here in Hong Kong, maybe not less than 50,000. Oh, yeah, well, we should you, should, you should try to convert all of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe do liturgy in French or something. Yeah, of all, course. All, all, almost ready, almost ready. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, jokes aside, jokes aside. But no, no, I, th I think that Hong Kong is a, is a very, you know, having visited you, as you remember, it's a very interesting place. And especially this part about so many different people in one place. Uh, which I think gives your parish very unique characteristics of being all missionary for the Chinese, but also uh, a little bit missionary for Western people who end up in Asia. You know, it's a very dynamic, uh, dynamic situation, I think, for you. Yeah, that's right. It's a um, natural goal, uh, goal and natural ministry for our service. And also in the same situation, situation we see Russian expatriates who are living here. Mm. And most of them are not, not religious at all. Yeah. So, uh, I think that now, now we have more Chinese people uh, in our parish than Russian. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's not uh, expected. So, yeah. So, I think it, it's, your parish is really doing mission to all the people, like, like Christ said, you know, to go out to all the people. So, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very wonderful So, Father, just before we end, perhaps you could just briefly tell us... Uh, um, uh, you know, what your parish needs mostly help with, and then I will uh, put the link uh, to your website uh, under this video, and, and those who, who have the means could perhaps help you. So if you could just tell what such help would go to and, and why you need it. Okay, I think that our main need is to uh, continue to uh, maintain place for service. We uh, have a mortgage for our church premises and uh, so 
Hong Kong is one one of most expensive city in the property in the world. Uh, still, we have to repay our mortgage. And it's uh, out of our capability actually, and ask for every one of friends and supporters from around the world uh, to contribute to this goal. Uh, another thing is our translation projects. We work on right now. We work on the book of uh, my uh, my elder by uh, by Saint Joseph Isichast uh, in Co. In this monastery in Arizona, uh, we continue to work on translation of liturgical texts, particularly 12 great feasts. Uh, and uh, it takes, of course, uh, time and uh, efforts of our translators uh, to whom I, sh I, I shall pay. Uh, so, using this opportunity, I also would like to introduce our uh, application applications for. Uh, iPhone and Android uh, or the calendar in English, in Chinese and Slavonic is, is quite popular, uh, in fact, in in Russia, but also in America. We have a lot of users who downloaded these applications and using this opportunity, I would like to introduce them to you. And I will, I will make sure to put the link uh, to the application under this video. Yeah. And also the link to your website, uh, where you could, where, where people could help out and donate in any way possible. Um, and, and if and if our listeners could could spread the word, because really I, I have visited Father Dennis uh, Parish myself, and I, I I know what what good work he and his people are doing. So any help is really crucial to continue this effort in a very we must say hostile environment, you know, because prices are high to live, uh, Chinese government maybe don't like it. It's a very uh, complicated situation. So any help uh, from anyone will be very, very helpful. And, and if you cannot help, please, please pray for Father Dionysi and, and his parish. That, that yes. always helps. <laughs> that always and helps. just keep in mind that if you are uh, traveling around the world uh, and visiting Hong Kong, there is a place to visit, uh, to pray in Orthodox Church. Yes, and it's and it's truly a beautiful church. It's on the twelfth floor in a in a high building. Very unusual, but once you go in there, it's it's actually it's actually very very cozy and beautiful. So, I can uh, guarantee. <laughs> okay, Father, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, thank you, thank you for your questions, and thank you for for your all your efforts that you do for the church. Uh, we will all be praying for you, and, and hopefully, I'll see you soon, Father. <laughs>